Meanwhile, Fouché, who was uneasy at the non-appearance of his Vienna messenger, one day waited on the emperor and attempted with an air of gaiety and cheerfulness to conceal his extreme embarrassment. There were several looking glasses, said the emperor in the apartment. I was very much amused at studying him by stealth. The expression of his countenance was hideous. He did not know how to enter upon the subject, which interested him so deeply. Sire, said he at length, the circumstance occurred to me four or five days ago, which I fear. I was wrong in not communicating to your majesty, but I have so much business on my hands. I am surrounded with so many reports, so many intrigues. A man came to me from Vienna with most ridiculous propositions, and he is now nowhere to be found. Monsieur Fouché said the emperor, you may injure yourself. If you take me for a fool, I have secured the man you speak of, and I have known the whole intrigue for several days. Have you said to bow? No, sire. That is fortunate for you. If it be otherwise and I obtain proofs of it, it may cost you your life. Subsequent events have proved that this would have been but justice. It appears, however, that Fouché had not said, and here the business ended. The 13th, the emperor breakfasted in the garden and sent for us all to attend him. He resumed the reading of the papers, which we had glanced at in the morning, and then proceeded to expiate on political affairs. The following observations of those which most forcibly struck me on the 13th of the the inhabitants of Paris are completely disgusted with the government, said the emperor, but the whole of the army, the great majority of the population, other departments, the lower class of citizens, and the peasantry remain attached to it. Thus the revolution triumphed over this grand attack of the counter-revolution, though it was only four or five years since the new principles had been promulgated. The most frightful and calamitous scenes had been witnessed, and a happy future was anticipated. But now how altered is the case if the soldier in his barracks seek to while away the tedious hours in talking of battles? He cannot speak of Fontenoy or Prague, which he did not witness. He must speak of the victories of Marengo, Austerlitz, and Yenna, of him who gained them, in short of me, whose fame fills every mouth and lives in every heart. Such a situation is unexampled in history. On whichever side it is viewed, nothing but misfortunes present themselves. What will be the result of this? Two classes of people, inhabitants of the same soil, will become mortal. Irreconcilable enemies will be the incessantly disputing and will perhaps finally exterminate each other. The same fury will soon spread through Europe. The whole continent will be composed of two hostile parties. It will be no longer divided by nations and territories, but by party colors and opinions. Who can foresee the crisis, the duration, the details of so many troubles? The event cannot be doubtful. The present enlightened age will not retrograde in knowledge. How unfortunate was my fall. I had imprisoned the winds, but bayonets have released them. I could have proceeded tranquilly in the universal regeneration, which can henceforth be effected only amid storms. My object was to amalgamate. Others perhaps will extirpate the 14th. The rainy weather had returned for two days. It had been miserably wet. Some vessels appeared in sight, and we learned by signals that they brought the new governor, Sir Hudson Lowe. The emperor was silent and melancholy during dinner. He was not well, and he retired very early. The 15th. About 12 o'clock in the morning, I received four letters from Europe, which rendered me as happy as I could possibly be at this place. I saw the emperor at 5 o'clock in the garden. He had taken advantage of an interval of fine weather. The rain had been pouring the whole of the day. I communicated to him the contents of my letters. All our party had received communications from Europe. They were delivered to us open, and they contained no news. But they proved that our friends still remembered us, and in our situation, such an assurance was peculiarly gratifying during dinner the emperor described to us contents of some french papers which he had by him and which he said gave an account of the shipwreck of la perusa his different adventures his death and his journal etc the narrative consisted of the most curious striking and romantic details and interested us exceedingly the emperor observed how highly our curiosity was excited and then burst into a fit of laughter this story was nothing but an impromptu of his own which he said he had invented merely to show us the progress he had made in english the 16th the new governor arrived at longwood about 10 o'clock notwithstanding the rain which still continued 
he was accompanied by the admiral who was to introduce him and who had no doubt told him that this was the most suitable hour for his visit. The emperor did not receive him. He was indisposed, and even had he been well, he would not have seen him. The governor, by this abrupt visit, neglected the usual forms of decorum. It was easy to perceive that this was a trick of the admiral. The governor, who probably had no intention to render himself at all disagreeable, appeared very much disconcerted. We laughed in our sleeves. As to the admiral, he was quite triumphant. The governor, after long hesitation and very evident Mark's ill humor, took his leave rather abruptly. We doubted not that this visit had been planned by the admiral with the view of prepossessing us against each other at the very outset, but whether the governor himself had any concern in it or entertained any suspicion of his design is a question which time will decide. After half past five, the emperor sent for me to attend him and the guard. He was alone. He told me that a circumstance had arisen, which regarded us all individually. It had been determined to require a declaration from each of us stating whether we preferred uniting our fate to that of the emperor to being removed from St. Helena and set at liberty. We could not guess the motive of this determination once it adopted by the English ministry for the sake of procuring regular documents. But at the time of our departure from Plymouth, this preliminary condition was perfectly understood. Was it hoped by this means to separate the emperor more completely from the world? But could it ever be supposed that we would forsake him? He asked what would be my determination on this point. I replied that it could not be for a moment doubtful. And if I ever felt a pang, it must have been at the moment my first determination that from that instant my fate had been irrevocably fixed. I had at first obeyed only the dictates of glory and honor, but in every succeeding day I had indulged my natural affection feelings. The emperor's voice assumed a milder tone, and this was the mode in which he expressed his thanks. I knew his heart and the full extent of his gratitude. I added that there was but little merit in my resolution. No change could take place in our situations the day after having signed the document. We should be the same as we had been the day before. Our fate depended not on human combinations, but the course of events. It would be very wise to add to our troubles by calculations beyond the reach of human foresight. It is our duty, tranquilly, to resign ourselves to the mysterious decrees of fate and in the depth of our misfortune to comfort ourselves with the reflection that our minds are free from self-reproach. This is a consolation which it is beyond the power of man to enfeeble or to destroy. The 17th, the emperor sent for me at 9 o'clock. He read to me an article in the Portsmouth Courier, which gave a very long and faithful description of his residence at Briars. He sent for me again in the middle of the day to converse with him. One part of the conversation affords so valuable a development of Napoleon's character that I cannot refrain from noting down some passage of it. There occasionally arose among us transient misunderstandings and disputes which vexed and annoyed the emperor. He adverted to this topic. He analyzed the situations with his usual train of reasoning. He calculated the miseries and horrors of our exile and pointed out the best mode of alleviating them. He said we ought to make mutual sacrifices and overlook many grievances. That man can only enjoy life by controlling the character given to him by nature, or by creating to himself a new one by education and learning to modify it according to the obstacles which he may encounter. You should endeavor to form but one family, said he. You have followed me only with the view of assuaging my sorrow. Ought not this feeling to subdue every other consideration if sympathy alone is not sufficiently powerful? Let reason be your guide. You should learn to calculate your sorrows, your sacrifices, and your enjoyments in order to arrive at a result just as we make additions or subtractions in every kind of calculation. All the circumstances of our lives should be submitted to this rule. We must learn to conquer ill temper. It is natural enough that little misunderstandings should arise among you, but they should be followed by explanation and not succeeded by ill humor. The former will produce a result. The latter will only render the affair more complicated. Reason and logical inference should, in this world, be our constant guides. He then proceeded to show how he had sometimes acted up to these principles and sometimes departed from them. He added that we ought to learn to forgive and to avoid that hostility and acrimony 
which must be offensive to our neighbors and prejudicial to our own happiness. Now we ought to make allowance for human frailties and humor rather than oppose them. What would have become of me, said he, had I not followed these maxims? It has often been said that I have been too good-natured and not sufficiently cautious, but it would have been much worse for me had my disposition been the reverse of what it is. I have been twice betrayed. It is true. And I may be betrayed a third time, but still it was my knowledge of human character and the spirit of reasonable indulgence which I had adopted that enabled me to govern France and which still perhaps rendered me the fittest person to rule that nation under existing circumstances. On my departure from Fontainebleau, did I not say to all who requested me to point out the line of conduct they should pursue? Go and serve the king. I wish to grant them lawful authority for doing what many would not have hesitated to do with their own accord. I would not allow the fidelity of some to be the cause of their ruin. And finally, above all, I did not wish to have anyone to censure on my return. I here ventured, contrary to my constant custom, to call the emperor in some measure to account. How, sire, I exclaimed, had your majesty any idea of returning when you left Fontainebleau? Yes, certainly, and by the simplest reasoning, if the Bourbon said I intend to commence a fifth dynasty, I have nothing more to do here. I have acted my part, but if they should obstinately attempt to continue the third, I shall soon appear again. It may be said that the Bourbons then had my fame and conduct at their own disposal. It was in their power still to represent me to the eyes of the common mass of mankind as an upstart, a tyrant, a firebrand, and a scourge. How much good sense and calm reflection would have been necessary to appreciate my real character and render me justice. But the men by whom the Bourbons were surrounded, and the erroneous line of conduct they pursued rendered my presence desirable. They restored my popularity and decreed my return. I should otherwise have ended my days on the island of Elba, and this would doubtless have proved most to the interest of all parties. I returned to discharge great debt, and not for the sake of resuming possession of a throne. Perhaps few will comprehend the motive by which I was actuated no matter for that. I took upon myself a heavy charge, but it was a duty I owed to the French people. Their complaints reached me, and how could I turn a deaf ear to them? Upon the whole, my situation at the island of Elba was sufficiently enviable and agreeable. I should soon have created to myself a new kind of sovereignty. All that was most distinguished in Europe was about to pass in review before me. I should have presented a spectacle unknown in history, that of a monarch descended from his throne beholding the civilized world defile before him. It may indeed be affirmed that the allies would have removed me from my island, and I admit that this circumstance hastened my return. But had France been wisely governed, had the French people been content, my influence would have ended. I should henceforth have belonged only to history, and the cabinet of Vienna would have entertained no idea of deposing me. It was agitation created and maintained in France that first gave rise to the thought of my removal. Here the Grand Marshal entered the Emperor's apartment. He came to announce the arrival of the governor, who was escorted by the Admiral and followed by the whole of his staff. After some further conversation, Bertrand was left alone with the Emperor, and I proceeded to the antechamber. Here all the suite was assembled. We endeavored to exchange a few words with each other, but we were rather bent on observing than conversing. In about half an hour, the emperor entered the drawing room, the valet de chambre on duty, who was stationed at the door within the apartment. Then summoned the governor, and he was introduced. The admiral was following close behind him. The valet, who had heard only the governor's name mentioned, suddenly closed the door without admitting the admiral, who was shut out in spite of his remonstrance, and he withdrew quite disconcerted into the recess of one of the windows. The valet de chambre, who was the cause of this affront, was no Veraz, a Swiss. A good and faithful servant of whom the emperor frequently said that this whole under 
understanding was absorbed in his attachment to his master. We were astonished at this unexpected occurrence, and we at first concluded that Nivaras had acted in obedience to the Emperor's wishes, though we had ample reason to complain of the Admiral, yet we did all in our power to relieve him from his embarrassment. His awkward situation distressed us. Meanwhile, the governor's staff was summoned and introduced, and this circumstance served only to increase the Admiral's confusion. In about a quarter of an hour, the Emperor took leave of his visitors. The governor came out of the drawing room, and the Admiral eagerly advanced to meet him. They said a few words to each other with some degree of warmth, then took leave of us and departed. I joined the Emperor in the garden, and our conversation turned on the Admiral's discomfiture. The Emperor knew nothing of the matter. The whole circumstance was solely the effect of chance. The Emperor declared himself delighted with the joke. He burst into a fit of laughter, rubbed his hands, and exhibited the joy of a child, of a schoolboy who had successfully played off a trick on his master. Ah, my good Navarro, said he, you've done a clever thing for once in your life. He had heard me say that I would not see the Admiral again, and he thought he was bound to shut the door in his face. But this honest Swiss may perhaps carry the joke too far. If I were, unfortunately, to say that we must get rid of the governor, it would be for assassinating him before my eyes. After all, said the emperor, assuming a more serious tone, it was entirely the governor's fault. He should have requested that the admiral might be admitted, particularly as he had informed me that he could be presented only by him. Why, again, did he not request the admiral's admission when he presented his officers to me? He is solely to blame. But, continued he, the admiral has lost nothing by the mistake I should without hesitation have apostrophized him in the presence of his countrymen, I should have told him that by the sentiment attached to the honorable uniform, which we had both worn for 40 years, I accused him of having in the eyes of the world degraded his nation and his sovereign by wantonly and stupidly failing in respect to one of the oldest soldiers in Europe. I should have reproached him with landing me at St. Helena just as he would have landed a convict at Botany Bay. I should have assured him that a man of true honor would show me more respect on my rock then if I were still on my throne and surrounded by my armies. The force and spirit of these remarks put a period to our gaiety and close the conversation. As I have thus saluted to the admiral and as he is now about to quit us, I will once for all sum up the insults with which we have to reproach him. And as much impartiality as our situation and the state of our feeling will admit of, we cannot pardon the affected familiarity with which he treated us, though our conduct afforded but little encouragement to it. Still less can we forgive him for having endeavored to extend this familiarity to the emperor. We can never forget the haughty and self-complacent air with which he addressed Napoleon by the title of general. The emperor, it is true, has immortalized that title, but the tone and the intention with which it was applied were sufficiently insulting. On our arrival at St. Helena, he lodged the emperor in a little room a few feet square where he kept him for two months though other residences could have been procured and there was one which the admiral had fixed himself upon he indirectly prohibited the emperor from riding on horseback even in the grounds surrounding the briars and the individuals of the emperor's suite were loaded with embarrassments and humiliations when they came to pay their daily visits to him in his little cell on our removal the long would he station sentinels under the very windows of the emperor and then by an evasion which savored of the bitterest irony he alleged that the step had been taken only with a view to the general's own advantage and protection. He suffered no one to come near us without a note from him, and having thus placed us in close confinement, he declared that these arrangements had been made only to secure the emperor against importunity, and that he, the admiral, was merely acting the part of grand marshal. He gave up ball and sent a written invitation to General Bonaparte. In the same manner as he did to every individual in the suite, he replied with the most unbecoming jeers to the notes of the Grand Marshal, who used the title of Emperor, saying that he knew no emperor at the island of St. Helena, nor any such sovereign in Europe or elsewhere, 
who was not in his own dominions, he refused to forward a letter for the emperor to the prince regent unless it were delivered to him open or he were permitted to read it. He even stifled the sentiments and expressions of respect which other individuals manifested to Napoleon. We were assured that he had put persons in inferior situations under arrest merely for having used the title of emperor or other similar expressions which however were frequently employed in the 53rd regiment doubtless as the emperor observed through an irresistible sentiment with which these brave men were inspired the admiral from his own personal caprice had limited the extent of our rides and walks on this subject he had even broken his word to the emperor at a moment when he appeared somewhat inclined to make concessions, he had assured Napoleon that he was free to ride in all parts of the island without being annoyed even by the sight of the English officer appointed to guard him. But a few days after this, just as Napoleon was on the point of mounting his horse to ride out to breakfast in a shady spot at some distance from our residence, he found himself under the necessity of renouncing this little enjoyment, the officer declared that he must henceforth form one of the party and ride close to him. From that moment, the emperor refused seeing the admiral. The latter had moreover neglected the most ordinary forms of decorum, always fixing upon unsuitable hours for his own visits and directing strangers who arrived at the island to select the same unseasonable periods for visiting the emperor. This was no doubt done with the view of preventing people from gaining access to Napoleon, who constantly refused to be seen on these occasions. It is already been stated that the admiral acted thus when the governor made his first visit to Longwood and the satisfaction he evinced at the governor's ill reception, but too plainly betrayed his design. However, if we were required to pronounce an impartial opinion on him, making allowances for the irritability of our own feelings and the delicacy of his situation, we should not hesitate to declare that our grievances rested in forms rather than facts. We could say with the emperor who had, after all, a natural predilection for him. The Admiral Cockburn is far from being an ill-disposed man that he is even susceptible of generous and delicate sentiment, but that he is capricious, irascible, vain and overbearing, that he is a man who is accustomed to authority and who exercises it un graciously, frequently substituting energy for dignity to express in a few words the nature of our relations with respect to him. We should say that as a jailer, he was mild, humane, and generous, and that we have reason to be grateful to him. But then as a host, he was generally unpolite, often something worse, and that in this character we have cause to be displeased with him. About two or three o'clock, the emperor took his usual airing. During our walk in the garden and our ride in the calash, he said, a good deal about the events of the morning and the conversation this subject was resumed after dinner so we jokingly observed that the two first days of the governor's arrival had been like days of battle and were calculated to make us appear very intractable though we were naturally most patient and accommodating at these last words the emperor smiled and pinched the ear of the individual who made the remark. The conversation then turned on Sir Hudson Lowe. He was described as being a man about 45 years of age, of the usual height, and of a slender make, with red hair, a ruddy complexion, and freckled. His eyes were said to have an oblique kind of expression, glancing askance, seldom fixed full in a person's face, surmounted by fair, bushy, and very prominent eyebrows. He is hideous, said the emperor. He has a most villainous countenance, but we must not decide too hastily. The man's disposition may perhaps make amends for the unfavorable impression which his face produces. This is not impossible. The 18th, the weather had been horrible for some days past, but it was cleared up a little today. The emperor went out early to take his walk in the garden. About four o'clock, he got into the calash and took rather a long airing than usual. Before dinner, the emperor desired me to translate to him the convention of the allied sovereigns relative to his captivity. It was as follows. 
Convention between Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, signed at Paris, August 20th, 1815. Napoleon Bonaparte, being in the power of the Allied Sovereigns, Their Majesties, the King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the Emperor of Austria, the Emperor of Russia, and the King of Prussia have agreed by virtue of the stipulation to the Treaty of the 25th of March, 1815, on the measures best calculated to preclude the possibility of his making any attempt to disturb the peace in Europe. Article 1. Napoleon is considered by the powers who signed the treaty of the 20th of March last as a prisoner. Article 2. His safeguard is specially entrusted to the British government. The choice of the place and the measures which may best ensure the object of the present stipulation are reserved to his Britannic Majesty. Article 3. The Imperial Courts of Austria and Russia and the Royal Court of Prussia shall appoint commissioners to reside in the place which his Britannic Majesty's government shall assign as the residence of Napoleon Bonaparte and who without being responsible for his security shall assure themselves of his presence. Article 4. His most Christian Majesty is invited in the name of the four courts above mentioned. Also to send a French commissioner to the place in Napoleon Bonaparte's detention. Article 5. His Majesty the King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland pledges himself to fulfill the engagements assigned to him by the present convention. Article 6. The present convention shall be ratified and the ratification shall be exchanged in the space of a fortnight or sooner possible in virtue of which the respective plan the potentiaries have signed the present convention and have affixed their seals thereto, given in Paris on the 20th of August in the year of our Lord, 1815. When I had finished translating this document, the emperor asked me what I thought of it. Sire replied, in the situation in which we are placed, I would rather depend on the interests of a single one than on the complicated decision of four. England has evidently dictated this treaty. You see how carefully she stipulates that she alone will answer for and dispose of the prisoner. She has been laboring to provide herself the lever of Archimedes. And therefore, it is not probable that she will entertain any idea of breaking it. The emperor, without explaining his ideas in this subject, averted to the different chances which might bring about his liberation from St. Helena. And he made the following remarkable observations. If the sovereigns of Europe act wisely and should succeed in completely restoring order, we shall not be worth the money and the trouble, which it must cost to keep us here. And they will get rid of us. But our captivity may still be prolonged for some years, perhaps three, four, five. Otherwise, sitting aside the fortuitous events, which are beyond the reach of human foresight, I calculate only on two uncertain chances of our liberation. First, that the sovereigns may stand in need of me to assist in putting down rebellion among their subjects. And secondly, the people of Europe may require my aid in the contest that may arise between them and their monarchs. I am the natural arbiter and mediator in the immense conflict between the present and the past. I have always aspired to be the supreme judge in this cause. My administration at home and my diplomacy abroad all tended to this great end. The issue might have been brought about more easily and promptly, but fate ordained otherwise. Finally, there's a last chance, which perhaps is most probable of all. I may be wanted to check the power of Russians. At, for in less than 10 years, all Europe may perhaps be overrun with Cossacks. Subject to Republican government, such, however, are the statesmen who brought about my overthrow. Then reverting to the decision of the sovereigns respecting him, he observed it was difficult to account for the style of the document and the malignant spirit that pervaded it. The Emperor Francis, said he, is a pious sovereign, and I'm his son-in-law. As for Alexander, we once loved each other. With regard to the king of Prussia, I doubtless did him much harm, but I might have done him much more. And after all, might he not have found real glory and still satisfaction distinguishing himself with generosity? As to England, it is to the animosity of her ministers that I am indebted for all. But it remained for the prince regent to observe and interfere or to be branded as a fool and a protector of vulgar malignity. One thing, however, is certain, namely that the Allied sovereigns have compromised, degraded, lost themselves by their treatment of me.
the 19th. This morning, the Grand Marshal and Madame Bertrand came into the garden in consequence of the emperor having expressed an intention of breakfasting there. But as he had passed a very restless night and had had no sleep, he breakfasted in his chamber. The governor gave us official notice that we must send him a declaration expressing our voluntary determination to remain at Longwood and to submit to all the restrictions which Napoleon's captivity might require. Why was as follows, declaration, I, the undersigned, repeat the declaration which I made when in Plymouth wrote, namely that I wish to devote myself to the fate of the Emperor Napoleon, to accompany him, to follow him, and to alleviate as far as lies in my power the unjust treatment he experiences, though the most unheard of violation of the law of nations, of which I am the more particularly sensible, as it was I who conveyed him to the offer and assurance of Captain Maitland of the Bellerophon, purporting that he had orders to receive the Emperor and his suite under the protection of the British flag, if agreeable to him, and to convey him to England. The Emperor Napoleon's letter to the Prince Regent, which is known to all England, and which I had previously communicated to Captain Maitland without his having made the slightest observation on it, explains to the world much better than anything I can say how frankly the Emperor met this offer of hospitality, and consequently how much he has been the dupe of his sincerity and confidence, notwithstanding the experience I have had of the horrors of a residence on the island of St. Helena, which is so prejudicial to the Emperor's health and to that of every European, and though during the six months which we have passed on the island, I have been subjected to every species of privations, which I myself daily multiply in order to avoid as much as possible the violation of that respect which my rank and habits demand, yet constant to my first sentiments, and resolved that for the future no fear of misfortune or hope of advantage shall separate me from the Emperor Napoleon. I repeat my desire to remain with him and to submit to whatever strictions may be arbitrarily imposed on him.